Okay, now we go back into darkness. As already explained, our boy Theo died at January 5042. So you can treat it as the end of 41, right at the end of Blepid Day, which is kind of a compliment to him. Okay. <clears throat> His kid Michael, however, didn't have a good life. First of all, he was only a kid when his dad died. Secondly, his mother um, wanted to, like, you know, do the Irene thing. And so he had a pro, you know, she was effectively doing the ruling during this period from 842 until 849. And the Bible, like I said, calls this a troublesome period. And it sevens there, which bothers me. But I'm going to try and go through why it works. All right. The whole point is to show what's the center portion of Byzantine history that sort of characterizes the whole out of which everything comes and therefore the sevening is not going to necessarily be what's expected I expect it to seven at the end of what we would call a textual paragraph but if you're doing the history the sevening is going to work differently based on turning points in history and that's what this is it's a turning point because she's the regent for him and therefore the whole country, given its history and given the way that they think about life and their reactions, it gets un unsettled. They don't really want a woman at the helm. And the woman that they had at the helm ruined the empire nearly. Ends up being overthrown. Remember that was in 803 by Nikki Foras. So when a woman comes to power again in the same way, they're like, oh, so there's turmoil. That's why there's a 14. Okay? Put special emphasis on whether you really know and love God or not. Because if you do, you're going to wait it out. And it's not easy to wait it out. Alright? You know that from your own life. So by 849, she's already been doing her thing for seven years. Ha ha. You get that. The six years. Oh, eight years, sorry. Alright. So that must be like the beginning of the year when he. Well, it is the beginning of the year when he dies. Duh, see, look at this. Alright. So. She's in control at the point that this thing sevens, and I'm not sure why it's sevening at 849 specifically. I, I have to do more research on her her time, but I don't I don't have the answer yet. What I do know is what happened afterwards. All right, so this is covering 850 to 867. So what happened there? Well, first of all, our boy. Michael the third, right here. You can read up on him there. And, you know, go look at the citations, too. Because, you know, don't just trust Wiki by itself. That just helps you get started. So, until 856, he's under her thumb. So it's Allah is two, three, four, five. So that's 850, 51, 52, 53, 54. Now it's 55. Now it's 56. So at this point, our boy Michael III is getting his independence. He finally overthrows his mother. Now the problem with it is that in order to do that, he was encouraged by one of his, his what do you want to call it faction 
to murder one of his mom's advisors in order to get power and he agreed to it and as I've tried to explain before when you get to power in the wrong way it always has a bad end and it's really going to have a bad end for Michael alright he's going to die exactly at this point 867 but at this point he's feeling real good oh I've overthrown mom put her in a monastery of course and now I'm ruling on my own yeah well the text doesn't honor well if he had known the text which he could have read Greek was his native tongue okay those days see but in those the days now there's I, I'm really I don't like it, it's like there's why is this listed twice the kainos and then we got a kainos again that's not normal but I can't find any manuscripts that disagree with it so it's like why is that being used twice because that's just not normal Greek and it's not normal mark so assuming that these words are alright because I can't find any copies that have something else then you have but in those the days that's a sort of convoluted way of stretching out the words there's a special name for that in um, grammar but I forget it but when you say those the days you're slowing it out you could have said in Tais Hemeras Ekainas because that's the normal way to put it so for this to be in this order is kind of like what now maybe that's on purpose to show that time is out of order because it certainly is he's just overthrown his mother by getting somebody in his faction to murder one of her advisors which gives him the the what do you want to call it the switch in loyalty so that he can go and you know put her in a convent so his future after this is not going to be good so it's the days now watch after meta means with but it also means after okay the tribulation there are many kinds of tribulation in life just like there are many kinds of salvation all right you always have to ask when you read one of these words in the bible which kind is it that so but in those the days after the tribulation that meaning above the one that was already been talking about and usually your english bibles will say something like but immediately after those days but the word immediately is not in here and which is really odd because mark that's one of mark's keywords immediately it doesn't actually mean immediately it means next in sequence without anything in between but it's usually translated immediately all right so why isn't immediate in here because it's not so then it's not over or he means something else or he's slowing down it what I'm trying to say is it causes you to slow down yourself and pay attention well, why is this word order there okay in those days after the tribulation not immediately after just after that tribulation okay when you get to it's probably somewhere in here it's really hard to tell exactly when probably after somewhere like that just after the word after since Michael has had at this point one two three four years okay from 856 it's now 860 alright so we'll just say after those after de the days because 860 is really important to talk about in 860 AD a bunch of stuff started happening north and west of Byzantium 
there was an influx of people called the Kivian Rusk. They were maybe from Scandinavia somewhere. Most people seem to think that's where they came from originally. They were pagans. They were raiders. They were interested in booty. And they sacked Byzantium. Well, not exactly Byzantium. They sacked Byzantium, but not Constantinople. They couldn't get in to sack Constantinople itself. The walls protected it. But outside, they got in. Now, it's real important to talk about the sequence here. Because it's a real important event in history. 860, they call it the, the sack, but it's not really a sack of Constantinople itself. It's the surrounding area. And they especially wanted to hit the monasteries. When the Rus do this, they are pagan. They had a whole lot of help from Bulgaria. Bulgaria was pagan. It's real important to talk about that. The Bible makes a big stink of it in the Matthew Gospel. I wonder if I still got it up here. I can show you. Okay, wait a minute. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll show you when I get to the punchline. Okay, that's 860. So they get raided outside their city. The monasteries mostly. The Rus come in and they take everything they can carry. Which includes, and this is really important, the Bibles that those guys had. Because the Bibles in Byzantium were, you know, rich, heavy, you know, covered in velvet and all kinds of illustration. You know, you just look at, you know, ooh, this is something expensive I can resell. So you take it. It took a lot, you know, the anything gold or brass or not so much brass, but silver, anything rich that they could find and, and resell or melt down. They couldn't read what they took of the Bibles. This is really important to the story. They could not read what they took of the Bibles, but they took them. They take them back up to Kiev. Alright. That's 860. Now if you look on a map. You will notice that to the left. Depending on the map that you got. But if you look on a map for the 800s. 860s in particular. You'll notice that to the left of Kiev. Not too far away. Is at that point. It was called the Kingdom of Moravia. Between 860 and 863, there's a lot of fighting that goes on in that area. I don't know why Moravia was deemed so important, but it was. And during that time, Louis the German, who was the head of the, the Frankish Empire at that time, they called it then the Holy Roman Empire, he ended up finally winning over Moravia. During that same three year period, Michael III had sort of like contact with Louis the German. Alright? And he, Michael III, wanted to evangelize people. Alright? He was sort of continuing the iconoclasm, but he was much more reasoning. And he wanted to evangelize people, and there were two people he had some sort of, like, suzerainty over, named Cyril and Methodius. And Cyril and Methodius were dispatched, somehow in concert with Louis the German, to Moravia. The idea was, and you can understand why they would do this, Hi, if we just Christianize these pagans, they'll stop raiding us. Because Louis the German was having the same problem. Well, it turns out that Moravia was kind of like Jonah visiting Assyria. You know, Jonah visits Assyria, who is Israel's worst enemy. God wanted Jonah to go. You can read this in the book of Jonah. Jonah didn't want to go. So he gets on a boat going in the opposite direction. And God decides, okay, well, we'll just have a little, we'll, we'll, we'll up in the boat. And so the boat is rocking and rocking, and now Jonah knows that he was wrong to do what he did, and he said, hi, just throw me over. And as soon as he gets thrown over, a whale comes up and swallows him. You know that story. And the whale just acts like a little taxi and goes all the way back 
to Nineveh. Well, not quite to Nineveh. He can't get up that far, but he throws them up on shore. And now Jonah is willing to give the gospel to the Ninevites, even though he hates them. He ends up dying there. Well, this is a story kind of like that. All right. These guys, Cyril and Methodius, are dispatched somehow in concert with Louis the German, between Louis the German and Michael the Third. And during the time that they're on their way, they decide, you know what? We're not just going to give them the Bible in Greek. We're going to translate it into Moravian. And that way, the idea was, if they convert and they believe, then they'll stop raiding. Just like Jonah was sent to Nineveh. Jonah didn't expect everybody in Nineveh to just turn around and believe in Christ. But they did. From the king on down. You can read it in the book of Jonah yourself. Jonah ends up living there until for the rest of his life teaching. Alright, well that's kind of what happened here with Cyril and Methodius. They translate the Bible into Moravian, which ends up using what they call a glass something or other script, which is pretty much the Cyrillic script. And because they translated it that way, not only Moravia goes wildly for it, rapidly converts to Christianity on their own wanting to but so do the Russians who had just finished sacking the area around Constantinople all of this happens between 860 and 863 and it was so important I didn't I didn't know any of this by the way until I started doing the meter it was so important that it's actually mapped right here this is Matthew now we're in Matthew see this right here parousia tu huio tu antropo antropo God comes to you through his word if you've seen the earlier videos I did on Matthew I've already covered the importance of the huias anaphora which is going to matter for Mark too because Mark is playing on the same meaning 833 is 863 and I got, I got to tell you, when I came to this and it's seven, I thought, this has to be wrong. I didn't know at that time when I first did the meter on this. I didn't know that this was an anaphora. The only thing I knew about was I'm in Lego. Who me? I didn't know about this. And I'm like, what the hell happened in 863? And so I went to Lucky, you know, because they like to give you the AD years. I thought, well, I can start here and see if I find anything significant related to the text. Knowing that I was looking for something about Bible coming to a people. Because that's what parousia means. God comes to you through his word. That goes all the way back to number six. You know, God came and visited Moses and Moses had to wear the veil after he saw God because he was so illuminated so it, it came to be shorthand God comes to you through his word you see why okay well 863 and I'm like what and if you looked in Twitter I had conversations with Clay Odom about it because I'm like I, I, I don't understand what this is and then as I was you know looking up the dates and stuff I thought huh and it was when I when I learned that this guy Cyril and Methodius wrote up a new alphabet and the Moravians converted and that alphabet was Cyrillic that's why they call it Cyrillic based on Cyril I'm like ding 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 because now we're talking about a whole continent converting hope you get that they went for it in a really big way three years after they invaded Three years after they invaded. All right, so that's 863. This is 867 at the end. So now let's count back the syllables. A kai ne three. Flipsy in the middle. See, because seven minus four is three, and then you add the thirty. So at 8.33, the same meter, 
the word clip scene is used and you're like well wait a minute clip scene is what how can you call it clip scene well it's first of all it's after the clip scene I want you to get the, the wit here after the flip scene yeah after the word meta okay see Hammeros is 860 well not actually count back to 860 we count back seven a kind that's three flip scene that's five I got two more to count back pain in the middle of middle of the word after the middle of it well what's the middle well what's the middle of the year summer that's the time when everybody wars and raids do you see the wit here after that flip scene they convert the Moravians convert so they stop raiding and I haven't even mentioned the most important portion of it yet. The Russians convert, so they stop raiding, at least other Christians. And most importantly, the nearest neighbor that the Byzantines had always had trouble with, the Bulgarians. They Christianize too. Massive change. Outside of Byzant Byzantium. They never become part of Byzantium. But because the word was in Byzantium and because the Russians had invaded Byzantium and brought back Bibles which Cyril and Methodius would need, hopefully you understand that, if they're going to translate the Bible and they're coming based on a Latin order from Louis the German, the only Bible they got to compare to is Latin. This gives them the Greek Bibles that they needed. They could read the Greek because they're dispatched from Byzantium. But Byzantium had just had its monasteries raided. So their Greek Bibles were taken. So now what is, are Cyril and Methodius going to translate from? The Latin? So as you see, I mean, I, it just doesn't get funnier than this. As pagans, they enter and take the Bibles that they, within three years, are going to end up believing in. Bibles they can't read. But Cyril and Methodius can read them. But Cyril and Methodius aren't dispatched anywhere. They're in Byzantium. Until three years later, Moravia is taken over by the Latin guy. Louis the German, head of the Holy Roman Empire. And he wants them converted. He wants the Bible translated into Moravian. Okay, but the Bible that he wants is in Latin. They need the Greek. And guess where the Greek Bible was? It, with the Russians. Who wanted to sell it anyway? Because as far as they're concerned, it's just booty. Yeah, and as soon as they get those Bibles, now they can translate from the Greek so that they're getting a better copy and a better translation. And now the Russians can actually read it in their language. And now the Moravians can read it in their language. And now the Bulgarians can read it in their language. You see how God orchestrated all this? Due to. Due to. With. See, it's, it, Meta means either with or after. Here it's got the significance of after, but it also means with. So God is basically saying, hi, when you're going through Thlipsis, I'm doing something with it that's going to profit you. See, there's lots of doctrine that the tie between the history being prophetically given by the numbers and the actual text. When you start to interrelate it with the actual history, now for us it's history, for these people going into it, can you imagine what Cyril and Methodius must have thought if they knew the meter then, which they didn't? But wouldn't they have been really excited? Oh, wow! Because, I mean, they knew it at the time. Hi, here are these Bibles. Oh, where are we we got to translate into Moravian, but all we got is this Latin Bible. Where are we going to get a Greek Bible since the Russians took them? Well, the Russians would be running around looking for, for a buyer, wouldn't they? 
Oh, well, here's a Greek Bible. We took it from Byzantium. Oh, we get our Bibles back. They would know that was providence, of course, but they wouldn't know that it was predicted here. You see the satire? You see the wit? That tribulation. Yeah, the one that happened in 860 when the yet pagan Russians sacked the area of the monasteries around Byzantium just in time to take the Bibles back just in time for Cyril and Methodius to arrive and just in time for them to wonder oh gee we've got these Latin manuscripts we've got to translate gee I wish we could have the Greek but they were sacked by the Russians three years ago oh yes we're the Russians from three years ago we sacked it here oh is that what that book says oh it's more valuable than I thought now that I can read it in my own language that tribulation and of course that's going to bring about a lot of tribulation and in particular going back to Michael the third he sponsored all that but he sponsored something else he sponsored a guy named Basil he sponsored that guy named Basil because he had a mistress he didn't like the wife he had or he was childless and so like Henry VIII, he wants to get a son. So he derives this ruse. Hi, you marry my mistress, but you don't touch her. You can have my sister instead. But you're officially married to my mistress. And uh, that way I can have sex with her. And if she has a kid, it's okay. And Basil says, sure. And Basil keeps being nice to him and being nice to him and being nice to him. And finally, Michael says, oh, well, you know, let's go all the way. I'll make you co-emperor, which he does. And that's happening right here, too. And then one day, Michael's really nice to another advisor he has. And Basil, that's this guy, Basil gets real upset. You like somebody better than me after all I've done for you? Because one of the other things that happened between Michael and Basil is Basil said, Hey, you know, you really ought to get this guy killed. And Michael says, Sure, you do it. Basil says, Okay. So Basil's pretty ticked off that maybe Michael is going to make somebody else co-emperor because he likes him better than Basil after all that Basil sacrificed. So what does Basil do? Kill him brutally in his own bed hacks him to death that was 867 after that flip scene and this is a sad story and yet at the same time it's true Michael was you know in instrumental in getting Cyril and Methodius to go at Louis the German's behest to Moravia to evangelize the Moravians and it didn't just end up evangelizing the Moravians it evangelized the Bulgarians and the Russians so now instead of having enemies on your north you have friends I mean they're not really that good of friends they still like to raid and stuff but they're a little they're nicer about it and they do it less often meanwhile he comes to a bad end so he got into power because he, one of his friends, not Basil at that time, one of his friends said, oh, well, let's kill an advisor. And because he starts liking another advisor at the end of his life, his life is ended by his best friend. Sic transit gloria mundi. Okay. Now, this particular verse doesn't have blepete in it, but I had to cover it to show you the outgrowth of blepete. The other reason I had to cover it is because God is centering everything on verse 23, verse 20. See, here's verse 20. That's a Kurios reference. See, you can see it up here. Here's This is where it started. Remember, first it sevens, and then we go through a non sevening period, and then it sevens again. And in this case, it unusually sevens twice which begs the question why alright and one of the interesting things about that is that 
when you start with the first the center of the blepite see remember the center of blepite was first nine whoops I did it the wrong way come on come on come on the center blepite right here it's verse nine Constantine and I talked about how you have to rope that to the center of all three anaphora so how do you find the center that's what we're doing here the center is the first curios first because it's occurring in the center of the text but more importantly because of the meaning of it it goes from verse 20 to verse 35 it's bookended it doesn't have a third so what is its center its center is going to have to be the first one it's the same kind of mechanism that Paul uses with the Eudokion at Pinon and the Temple Trio Anaphora that I did in my 150 page long thing on Ephesians 1 which you know it'll make you die to read it took me five years to write it okay but using that same technique is how I found it here alright so that's the start of the center is verse 20 which is right here and you can see why it is a start because it's sevens here which I thought was really odd I couldn't understand why it's centered here that's why I'm, I've, I was trying to look for the center so that's the, it's a way of stating hi this is the center of history everything that's going to happen after this is going to be a result of it specifically this period you know there are a lot of things everything's a result of everything in history but not everything's a result of something pivotal this is a pivotal period of history so it starts at Leo the third and we're coming to our first our next blepite after this one after, after this one that it centers on here um, in verse 20-23 okay so our first one was you know our, our, our center blepite so you're looking for what the center centers on I'm sorry this is so complicated but this is how they organized their um, material all right they didn't have chapters and verses they didn't have highlight in yellow so they had to come up with other devices okay that's our center blepite so everything is supposed to come from this okay but it's gonna have to have an apex all right the apex is gonna be the beginning of the next anaphora which is right here all right and then the apex of that anaphora all right where is it Verse 20 the apex of that anaphora there isn't there's only another bookend so if there's only another bookend that becomes the the place you rope to and that should be your center all right so then the next question is all right that's verse 20 right here that's the center nexus all right but it's going to have its own center where is that well verse 23 is the next blepite because see you got a blepite on the outside of the center Corias is the envelope so now you got to find another blepite to tie to the prior blepite because the prior blepite is the center of all the blepites. So it's got to tie to something on the inside between Corias and Corias. Well, here it is, the verse we're talking about. And you see kind of why it would be right to do that? Because you're talking about the conversion people being saved uh, it, yes their religion is apostate yes their beliefs were apostate yes they were ignorant yes they had all kinds of goofball things but if you believe Jesus Christ paid for your sins you're saved even if you don't know that's the gospel if you do it you're saved well for all the flaws and problems of the Catholic Church whether it's Greek Orthodox or Western you know Roman they taught that every day all the time 
They used it as a guilt trip. They used it to make money. They used it for all the wrong reasons. But it was the one thing they kept on saying. Jesus Christ is God and he paid for your sins as humanity. They were relentless in saying it. Okay, well, when you believed in Christ the first time, you didn't understand that there were all kinds of false doctrines associated with that claim. Your parents probably had a lot of screwed up doctrines in their head. They didn't know either. Neither did their teachers. This is true for most of history. But did you hear that he paid for your sins? The answer for the world for centuries has been yes. And at some point in your life once, did you ever believe it? And the answer for most people, usually when they were kids, is yes. After that, they started thinking about it, and all oh, this can't be true. I'm an atheist. I'm a Buddhist. I'm a. I believe in the Quran. I don't believe in anything. You know, whatever. But you did it once. So, after the tribulation, that one, that tribulation. The tribulation of being around these people who talk about Christ all the time and in a weak moment you believe. Okay? You see the kind of wit there? Centering on really Theophilus here not so much oh crud. Centering on Theophilus here Right at Blepite, not so much on the aftermath, but he did say it in advance. You get you get the wit there, or am I being too obtuse? Let me know, because I'm going to move faster now after this. <laughs>